In this tutorial, we're going to run through the process to create and toolpath the part that you can see on the screen here, ready to be cut on a CNC machine with a rotary axis. We're going to start by doing the standard wrapped job setup so that we can orient and size the part correctly. Then we're going to import a simple set of vectors, do a swept shape, and then create the toolpaths. We're then going to make some edits to the design to create the box cross section at the top along with the octagonal part on the bulging shape in the centre. And then we'll look at recalculating the toolpath to take into account the changes that we've made to this design. So let's just go to File, Close. Now as we're working with a rotary job we're going to set up the part by going to the Gadgets menu drop down here and right at the bottom we have a wrapping section and we're going to look at setting up a wrapped job setup so I'm going to click on that and that's going to open up a form that we can specify the size and orientations for our part relative to the machine. So the first thing we need to do is specify the cylinder dimensions. So for the length we're going to go with 26 inches for the cylinder or the stop diameter we're going to put in 4 inches. I can see inches is selected here. Let me move on to the orientation. Now this is where we choose to wrap the Y values around the rotary axis or we could choose to wrap the X values around the rotary axis. Now this is dependent on the orientation of your CNC's rotary axis. So you will need to check with the manufacturer or look at your CNC in order to see which setup you have. For demonstration purposes only, we are going to keep the linear axis along X and look at wrapping the Y value, so I'm going to use this option here. Then we need to specify our X, Y, 0 position. In this case, we're going to go to the lower left hand corner and then we need to specify our Z, 0. Now, the Z0 in this example, we're going to set to be the cylinder axis or the bottom. And this is going to be the most reliable choice as it's much harder to set your Z0 on the outside edge of your cylinder because that requires your cylinder to be a perfect circle for that to be correct. Now, the cylinder axis is the equivalent in the software to setting your material to the bottom of the block to be Z0 on a regular three axis job. Then we have the option to choose our wrapping layout and in this case we're going to go with a simple cylindrical wrap where we cut a straight line along the cylinder and unwrap it. You do have the option to create a spiral wrap. So with that we're just going to go here and press OK and then the software will automatically create the right size job for us. Now it's important to note here that whenever we are working in a spire, we are always working in a three axis environment. So we're going to model the part and create the toolpaths in a standard XYZ three axis orientation. We will have the ability to preview and see what the part will look like when the Y axis is wrapped around the rotary, but the only time that wrapping will occur is when we choose a post processor that has the wrapping ability built into it that's appropriate to our CNC and we save the toolpaths. Until then, the software only considers this as a three axis job. We just happen to have the ability to view that as if it was wrapped around a cylinder. Now when we use the wrapped job setup gadget to create the layout, we also get a couple of layers that are automatically created along with some vectors. So let's just take a look at those. If we go to the layer manager at the top, you'll see that we have two rail sweep rails. If I just switch the visibility of that layer on, you can see we have a rail on the left and we have a rail on the right. We're going to use those in a moment. Then we have another layer called bounding box and if I switch the visibility of that layer on you'll see we have a vector that represents uh, the outside of our job space. Now I don't need this so I'm just going to right click, I'm just going to delete that layer and I'm just going to delete the data also from that layer and we'll just go ahead and press OK. So now we're going to import a vector that represents the basic profile for the shape that we're going to wrap. So come over to File Operations into the Import Vectors from File. In the Rotary Machine in 3D Files project folder, we're going to open the rotaryprofile.eps file. 
So here I have a vector that represents the basic shape for the part that we're going to wrap. I pre-drew this in the software before exporting it out as an EPS file. When creating a wrapped part, your first job is to sketch out the shape of the profile. Now, as I've already done that, I'm just going to take that and just move that out of my job space here. Now, you'll see that I've got Smart Snapping switched on, so when I take my vector here, I've put it into transform mode, when I drag that down, I can keep that in line with that vertical line, which I'm just following along there, and I'm just moving that out of the job space. We've got a nice clean empty work area here to work with. So now that I have all of the vectors I need to create the simple swept shape to then show you that in the wrapped rotary preview and then run some toolpaths. Now before we create our swept shape I'm just going to take a moment to organize my layers. So if we go to the layers tab at the bottom there, you'll see here that we have a layer called layer 1. Judging by this icon, we currently have no vectors on there, so I'm just going to delete it. So we right click, use the option to delete, and it will delete that. Okay, so then we're going to go down to the import rotary profile. So this is the vector that we just imported. I'm just going to change the name of that just to simplify it. We're just going to call that one rotary profile just to keep that nice and simple. And then I'm going to add in a new layer and we're going to call this layer components. And this is the layer where we're going to add our component grayscales to. So I'm just going to click to accept that. Okay, this is currently the active layer. I'm just going to move that up to the top of the list. That way when I create any components, the grayscales are going to go onto this layer and it's not going to obscure any vectors that we have on the layers below it. So now we're ready to go and create our swept shape. So to do that, we need to go into the modeling tab. We're going to look at using the two rail sweep to create this shape. So two rail sweep requires me to have two rails and a cross section. So we've got our rails here, we've got one on the left, hold down shift and we'll select the one on the right. You can see that they are now both selected there. I'm going to say use selection, you know, undraw scale cross section with width, undraw sweep between spans, go ahead and select my cross section. And then we could give this a name and we're just going to call this one main profile and then we could just go ahead and press apply if I wanted to I could come over to tile my windows horizontally that way I can see both the 2D and the 3D view and then we could just simply go ahead and press close so let's just organize our components all I'm going to do here is just right click on the level I'm just going to rename that level I'm just going to call this one basic shape and so we can see the part in the three axis environment where we have linear x, linear y and linear z. But we do have the ability to view this in a rotary view. And to do this the focus must be on the 3D view. So you must click into the 3D view in order for us to view this in the rotary view. In this case I'm actually just going to maximize the 3D view here. So if we come over to toolpaths and then here we have the option to go into the toolpath drawing. And you'll see here, currently we have the option wrapping off is checked. Now we have two options, we have wrap Y values or wrap the X values. Now we set this up wrapping the Y values around the X axis. So we're just going to click on this option here. And so you can see we've got a good indication of what my part will look like that we're going to create our toolpaths on. Now, in order for us to create the toolpaths, we need to go back into the standard three axis view. So we need to go back up to the toolpaths, toolpath drawing, and we're just going to switch the wrapping off. And so at this stage, we could go and create the roofing and finishing toolpaths, and that would be all we need to cut this part. Now as you can see from the model, we have a number of flat areas on the actual model itself. Now to get the best results in those areas, a 2D toolpath would be beneficial. We're not going to worry about this area, as we will be changing this area shortly to create a square profile. 
Now before we calculate the toolpaths, let's look at creating some boundaries for the 2D toolpaths just to be a little bit more efficient in how we calculate them. So let's just go and switch over to the 2D view. I'm going to use this option here to zoom to fit. So if we go to the layers tab, I'm just going to switch off the components layer. We're also going to switch off the two rail sweep rails layer. I'm going to look at adding in a new layer. I'm going to call this layer 2D Pocket and this is the layer where we're going to draw out the vectors that represent the flat areas for us to apply a 2D Pocket toolpath to. So I'm just going to make sure that that is the active layer and we're going to go into the drawing tab and say so we're going to look at drawing rectangles that represent those 2D flat pocket areas. So we're going to go and use the Draw Rectangle tool. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we do have Smart Snapping enabled, and that's going to help us accurately draw out the areas that are the flat spaces that we're going to pocket out. So to do that, I'm going to come over to this point here. So this is a flat area, and I'm just going to hover over the tip there and then just drag that up and then you can see that I'm now in line with the bottom of my job space so I can see my two lines there which I'm able to snap to and I can pull out a rectangle in which case here I'm just going to wake up this point on the right hand side and you'll see I've got a line to follow there and I can drag that all the way up to the top until I meet that top horizontal line and then I could just let go of the mouse to create that rectangle I'm going to do the same over at this area here, so I'm just going to take this point, follow that along and we're meeting there with the horizontal line at the bottom of our job space. Now I'm going to click to create that rectangle, I'm just going to come over here just so I can snap to the side of that curve there and then just follow that line along until we meet the top of our job space which is here and I can let go to create that rectangle. And we're going to come over here to snap to that point, follow along there. And I'm going to click as soon as I meet up with the bottom of the workspace. And again, we're just going to drag that up to the top right hand corner there. So you can see I have one, two, three rectangles there that represent the flat areas that are in line with the actual profile shape itself. So now I'd like to create two rectangles that represent the 3D areas. So let's go to the layer manager at the top here. I'm just going to look at adding in a new layer. So here we're going to call this one 3D boundary, like so. What I may want to do just to help us differentiate the vectors on these layers just to alter the uh, layer colour. So for the 2D pocket, let's just go to this icon here and we're going to look at making this one orange and for the 3D boundary we'll make this one green. Okay, So that's the active layer, so now I could go ahead and draw the rectangles for the 3D boundary. So we're going to snap to this point here and then we're just going to bring that over to the corner over there and I'm going to come over to this point here, snap to the top and then snap to the bottom corner there and you'll see we've created the second rectangle here. So we've got two rectangles, the green ones, that represent the 3D areas. Now before we go and create the toolpaths, one thing that can be beneficial when doing rotary machining is to come slightly past the edge of your part in order to make sure that you don't leave any kind of seam at the top or the bottom. And this is to hide where the part wraps around and joins up. So to help us do that, we're just going to slightly increase the height of the pocket vectors that we just created. So let's come over to the layer manager. I'm going to go to the 2D pocket. I'm just going to right click on this icon here and use the option to select layer vectors. So we can see those three rectangles are now selected. I'm going to come over to transform objects. I'm going to use the option to set selected object size. And make sure that link XY is unchecked as it's only the height that I want to change where we're going to anchor this around the center of those rectangles. So just going to change the height of that, we're going to make that 13 and then we're going to go ahead and press apply so you can see that we have extended the rectangles there and then we could just simply go ahead and close that down. 
And so you can see that the boundaries come slightly past the top and the bottom edges of the part. Now we don't need to do this for the 3D boundaries, as the 3D toolpath itself contains a boundary offset feature, which we'll look at doing that when we come to run the 3D toolpath. So let's just go and tile our window. So we've got the 2D view at the top and the 3D view at the bottom there. And now we're ready to go over to the Toolpaths tab. So to do that, we're just going to use this icon here to switch over to the Toolpaths tab. And so the first thing we need to do is go into our Material Setup. And so here we're just checking over the setup as we define this when we set up the wrap setup at the start of this tutorial. Now the diameter of the cylinder was 4 inches, which is the equivalent of 2 inch thick material in a 3 axis environment. XY datum position is in the lower left hand corner, and then we specified the centre of the cylinder as our Z0, which is the equivalent to setting your Z0 to the machine bed or the bottom of the block. Let me move on to the model position in the material. Now the model that we're working with here is the same thickness as our material, so there's nothing really to adjust in terms of where it sits within that block of material. Now if your model is less than the thickness of the material, then you'd want to position the model to the bottom with this particular setup. Let me move on to the rapid Z gaps above the material, so I'm just going to alter the clearance, just make that a little higher, 0.5, plunge at 0.25, Home start position is at x0, y0, and then the z gap above the material must be at least the thickness of our material plus the highest of our rapid z gaps, so we can make sure that we clear the block. So I'm going to keep that at 2.5, so that's the thickness at 2 and the 0.5 uh, plus on the clearance to make that 2.5. Then we could go ahead and press OK. So the first toolpath we're going to create is a 3D roughing toolpath to hog out the majority of the material on the 3D parts. So let's come over to the 3D roughing toolpath. So here we're going to select a tool from the tool database. We're going to look at using a quarter inch end mill, check over the settings, go ahead and press OK. Use the edit option, I'm just going to change the pass depth here, I'm going to up that to a quarter of an inch, we could go ahead and OK that. Then we need to choose our machine in limit boundary, in this case we're going to go with the model boundary in this case, it's going to take that model to apply this roughing machine in toolpath to. Then for the boundary offset we're going to keep that at zero. Machine allowance, I'm just going to leave that at 0 0.05, so just uh, leave a little skin of material there for the finish cut. And then we need to choose our roughing strategy. So in this case, we're going to use the Z level strategy where we have the option to raster in X or we could raster in Y. Now, raster in X will cut along the X axis before stepping over, and this direction is very important when doing a rotary setup. So when we apply the raster X option, the tool will cut along the X axis, and then there will be a short rotary move, which is the equivalent of the step over, in which case the tool will just raster back again. If we use the option to raster in Y, so that the toolpath is going in this direction, that will be the equivalent of the part spinning all the way around with the tool, and then stepping over in X, and then spinning all the way around again. So it all depends on how you want to machine this. Now for most people's setup, you're probably going to want to use the raster X option. So then we can just come to the bottom, give that a name, we'll just call that 3D Roughing, and we'll go ahead and press Calculate. We just maximise the 3D view there, so you can see the toolpath, and then we could just simply go ahead and preview that. Okay, so you can see the tool creating our part there, and if we wanted to, we can view this toolpath preview in a rotary environment. So if you just go back up to the toolpath, so remember ensuring that we are in the 3D view, go to the toolpaths, toolpath drawing, wrap Y values, and we can see how our part will actually look when we come to machine that. Okay, so there is our part. 
So let's just go back to the toolpath drawing. I'm just going to turn the wrapping off there. And now what I'd like to do is look at pocketing uh, the flat areas. So let's close out of the preview and then we're going to go into the 2D view. We're just going to switch over to the design commands and then we're going to come up to the top here and just zoom to fit our work area. Now I want to take a couple of measurements to work out the cut depths for these 2D toolpaths. And so if we go and just click into the white space here and we're going to use the measure tool. Now the measure tool, I can work out how far down I want to cut the first pocket. So this is the first pocket here. Now we know that this top left area here is equal to the outside of my cylinder. So we can just use this to measure cut depths from. So I'm just going to click at the top here, so I'm just snap into the top point there and then I'm just going to snap to the bottom here and when I click there we can see that I have a Y distance here of 1.075 and that's going to be the depth of cut for that pocket so I'll make a note of that value there. So let's have a look at the Y value for the next pocket. So again we're just going to click at the top here for our reference point and we're just going to come over to this area over here, snap to that point, click in place and we can see that my Y distance is 1.25. So again I'm just going to make a note of that also. And we'll move on to the last area which is this pocketing area here. Again let's click at this top point and then bring our cursor over where we can snap in place and then we can see that we have a Y distance of 1.5 and again we're just going to make a note of that number also. So now that I've made a note of the three different values I can now go ahead and create the three pocket toolpaths at the different depths that we measured. Now I could use a 3D toolpath to cut the entire part out but it's much more efficient to use 2D toolpaths for what is essentially 2D flat areas and that way we can limit the 3D toolpaths to only the 3D areas. So let's just close out of the measure tool. So we're going to tile our windows and we could switch over to the toolpaths tab to create those pockets. Put this in the ISO view. Then we're going to go and select our first vector to create our pocket toolpath with. With that selected, let's come over to the pocket toolpath. Here we need to specify our cut depths. Now for the start depth, we've already cut most of the way down with the roughen tool. So what we can do is we can make the start depth at 1 inch there. And so we'll make the cut depth at 0 0.075, remembering that 1.75 value distance from the top to the bottom of this flat area here. So with the start depth at 1, the cut depth at 0 0.075, we have a combined value of 1.075. And we can select a tool from the tool database. In this case, we're going to use a quarter inch end mill. We'll OK that. We'll come down. We're going to raster this, where we're going to raster along the x axis. So we're going to make the angle here at zero. Come down to the bottom. We're just going to leave this named as pocket one. And then we could go ahead and press calculate. Okay, so you can see that there. I'm not just going to preview that just yet. We'll just move on to the second pocket toolpath. So we'll close out of the preview toolpath form. Then we're going to select the second vector, which is this one here, for our second pocket. With that selected, let's go back into the pocket toolpath. And so here we need a total cut of 1.25. So again, we're going to change the start depth here, make that 1. Cut depth is going to be a quarter of an inch. There we have a combined value of 1.25. Over the exact same setting, so quarter inch end mill, where we're going to raster, the angle is going to be at zero. Call that one pocket two, and then we could simply go ahead and press calculate. We can see it's calculated that there for us. Okay, again, I'm not going to preview this just yet, so we'll just close out of the preview toolpath form. 
I'll go ahead and select the last vector that we need to pocket and go into the pocket toolpath. And so here we need to do a total cut of one and a half inches. So again we're going to alter the start depth, so we're just going to increase that to 1.25 and the cut depth is going to be a quarter of an inch, so we've got a combined value there of 1.5. Again exactly the same settings, call that pocket 3, go ahead and calculate that and you can see we now have our three toolpaths visible and so we could go ahead and preview all of those toolpaths there. So it's just going to run through all of those and you can see those pockets have been added in there. So it's nothing really exciting here, we're just cutting away at the three flat levels. So now we can look at creating our 3D finishing toolpath for the area here and here. So let's just close out of the preview toolpath form. To help us select the vectors, we're just going to go over to our layer manager. I'm just going to switch off the 2D pocket layer and we'll just click over into the white space. And here I can select this vector, shift and select this vector here. And now we've got both boundary vectors selected for the 3D areas. So with those vectors selected, let's go over to the 3D finishing toolpath. First thing we need to do is select a tool from the tool database. I'm going to go with quite a large tool. I'm going to use the quarter inch ball nose and go ahead and press OK. okay so we've got our vectors for our machine in limit boundary. So we're going to use the selected vectors there. I'm going to apply a very small offset here of 0.1 just so that the tool comes a little bit past those vectors. Do that in a raster strategy, the angle at zero, and then we could go ahead and call that one 3D finish and go and calculate that. Okay, so it's calculated that for us. We could maximize the 3D view here, and then we could go and preview the selected toolpath there. So you can see it's just creating that finish pass for us there in the preview and like we've seen before we could go ahead and actually view this in the wrapped view so let's go to the toolpaths toolpath drawing and we're going to use the wrap y option and then here we have our part and this is what we'd get if we were to output these toolpaths on our rotary axis Okay, so now what we could do is we could go ahead and save those toolpaths. So let's just close out of the preview toolpath form and then we'll go into the save toolpath icon here. So here we could output all visible toolpaths to one file. So let's select all of the tools that use the same quarter inch end mill. So we know that the roofing and the three pockets all use the same tool. So we could check this option and output those to one file. So with those selected, what we need to do now is choose an appropriate post processor for your machine. Now it's very important to note that it has to be a post processor that supports rotary moves. And this is a stage where the software is going to take what are essentially three axis calculated toolpaths and then convert them into rotary. Now the post processor has to support rotary and needs to be set up so that it's configured correctly for what your rotary axis is. For example, if we go to the post processor list and if I just type in M on the keyboard, I'm trying to access the Mac 2.3 control program where we have special posts that wrap X to A and that wrap Y to A. Now in our case, we are wrapping the Y axis, so we choose this option where we are wrapping the Y axis to A, A being the typical designated G code for a rotary move. So we're going to use this option here and then what we'll do is we'll simply go ahead and save the toolpath. And so here we are now presented with the wrapped settings form uh, before we go ahead and save this. And this is really just a reminder to check that the settings are correct before we go ahead and save out those toolpaths. In this case we could just go ahead and press OK if we are happy that the settings we have here are correct. So just simply go ahead and press OK and then you could simply give that a name and then save those toolpaths out. OK, 
Okay, so let's just close out. Obviously, you'd save out the 3D finish toolpath as well. So let's just close out here. So let's just switch off the visibility of those toolpaths. And so, so far, we've seen the process for using a simple swept vector in order for us to create the 3D shape where we calculated the relevant 3D roughing, 2D pocket toolpaths, and the 3D finishing toolpath to cut the part out. So now I'd like to take this and create a slight variation of this. Where what I'd like to do is look at creating a box shape for this top section here and an octagonal shape for this bulbous area that we've got there. And to do this, it will require me to use the Vector Unwrapper gadget, which has been created to help us when doing a wrapped job. So let's just go to the toolpaths, to toolpath drawing. I'm just going to turn the wrapping off there. And then we're going to go over and switch to the drawing tab. And we'll look at tiling our windows now the vector unwrapper requires me to draw a vector which represents the cross section as I want to see the object once it's been wrapped. So to do this I need to draw a square that represents the box shape and then use it to unwrap that to create a vector that I can sweep in the three axis environment to get the right shape. So to help me get these shapes, we need to take a few more measurements of the actual profile. So we're just going to select that profile and use this option here to zoom active view to the selected object. Then we're going to go over into the measure tool. So first, I want to measure the vertical distance from the center of the part to what's going to be the face of my box in this section here. So we're going to snap to the bottom there, snap to the top there, come over to the measured form and you can see that I have a Y distance of 1.4. So I'm going to need to create a square that is 2.8 inches across the flat, so we're just doubling the value there. So now I'd like to look at the distance for the octagonal height at its lowest point, which is this point here. So again we're going to start at this point and I'm just going to snap to that point there, we can see we have a Y distance of 0.75. So I'm going to need an octagon that is going to be 1.5 inches across. And then what I need to do is measure the highest part of our octagonal shape, which is this area here. So again, snap to that bottom area, snap to the top here, you can see we have a Y distance of 1.75, so we're going to double that for the full distance, and that will be 3.5. And you'll see the effect of these measurements in a moment when we come to create the shapes. And so I've took a note of all the measurements, so we've got 1.4 for the box, which is 2.8 across. We have 0 0.75 for the lowest part of the octagonal shape, which is 1.5 across. And then we have 1.75, which is ultimately going to be 3.5 across. So let's just close out of the measure tool. And so the first cross section is going to derive from a box that is 2.8 inches across. And so to do this, we're going to draw a square, which is 2.8 by 2.8. So let's come over to the draw a rectangle option, give that a width of 2.8, a height of 2.8, go ahead and press create. So let's just uh, zoom our view there, so you can see the box has been created, and we could go and close out of that form. Now, when you select a vector to unwrap, it must be in the center of the job. So with that selected, let's just press F9 on the keyboard to center that to our job space. Now before we unwrap it, I want to show you that when I design this and to ensure that this square will fit into cylinder material that we're working with, and we need to be aware that the points of this square are contained within that cylinder. So let's go and draw a circle, so it's going to snap to the centre of that square, I'm just going to pull that out and I'm just going to type in 4 followed by D on the keyboard, that's going to create the circle with a diameter of 4 inches for me. And so if we zoom in there, you can see that we do have 
a little bit of clearance with the box cross section in order to fit in that when we create the toolpaths for this. So let's just press F to fit that to the screen and we're just going to delete that circle. So I'm going to take it and use the delete key to delete it. So now we're ready to actually unwrap that box. So to unwrap that we need to select the square and if we go to the gadgets and go to the wrapping section you'll see we have the vector unwrapper and when I click on that you'll see that the software has created a vector and it will create additional vectors on other layers that we'll come to in a moment. Now with this new vector, I'm just going to rotate that. I can rotate that using the 9 key on the keyboard. And I'll do that in increments of 45 degrees. So I've done that twice and then I'm just going to take that vector and I'm just going to move that down to the bottom there. Now I could go ahead and delete this square. So I don't need that anymore, I can just delete it. Let's just maximise the 2D view and use this option here to zoom to fit. I'm just going to take that wrapped vector, just move that over to the left there. Now if we come to our layer manager at the top here, when we unwrapped that vector, what it's done is created uh, several layers. So we've got the layer with the unwrapped vector and we've got a layer where it's created unwrapped vector drive rails which you can see here and here. Now I don't need those vectors as I need to limit the area where we're going to create our sweep. So I'm just going to right click here and use the delete option and we're going to look at deleting that data also. We could go ahead and press OK. Going back into the layer manager we're just going to turn the visibility of the 3D boundary layer off going to add in a new layer, we'll call this layer rails as this layer is going to have vectors that we're going to create that are going to form the rails for our new swept shape for the box area. Just to help us see this layer more clearly we're just going to change the colour of this layer, we'll just make that a turquoise colour and then we'll just click into the white space there. So to create the two rails for our two rail sweep, we're going to look at using the polyline tool to draw horizontal lines that match up with the position of the box area that we intend to create here. So let's go into the polyline tool. Like we did earlier, we're just going to look at waking the point up. So you can see I'm snapping to that point. I'm um, not clicking here, I'm just going to drag my cursor up and you'll notice that we've got that vertical line that I can follow along. And now I have the horizontal line at the bottom of our job. So here's the point that I want to click at. So I'm going to click to put in my first point. Then I'm just going to follow along here. I'm just going to wake the point up on the right hand side of where our box shape is going to be. And I'm going to drag my cursor up to follow along the vertical until it meets that horizontal line at the bottom of my job. And I can click to accept that. Use spacebar just to finish off that line but stay in the polyline tool. And here we're going to just wake the end point up of that vector we just created there. Move my cursor up to follow along the vertical until we meet the horizontal line at the top, which we can see that there. And I can just click in place. And then I'm going to come over to the right hand side until I find the right hand object bounds of my line, which I can see that there. So I can just simply go ahead and click that in place. Right click and I know that my two horizontal lines are in line with each other thanks to the smart snapping. So now we have our two rails and we've got our box cross section here. We're now ready to go and create the two rail sweep. So let's just go into our layer manager here. I'm just going to switch the visibility of the components layer on. I'm just going to make that the active layer as well so that when we create the component the grayscale will be added to that layer. Let's just click into the white space. I'm going to go down into the modeling tab. And for the time being, we're just going to switch off the visibility of the basic shape level. Then we're going to right click and we're going to look at inserting a new level. Right click, we're going to rename that level. And we're going to call this level 
decorative shapes. And so any new components that I create now will be added to this level here. So let's go and tile our windows horizontally. And then we're going to go into the two rail sweep form. So we're going to select our vector rail. So we've got this vector here, shift, and select this vector here. Say so use selection. And we're going to go and apply that cross section. And we're just going to give that a name. We'll just call this one box shape and I'm going to go ahead and press apply. Okay, So you can see we've got quite an odd looking shape there. Uh, so if we just close that down we'll just maximize the 3D view there and then we're going to take a look at this part in the wrapped view. So let's go to the toolpath, so we'll go to toolpath drawing, wrap the Y values and you can see there that we have a box shape and this is the size of the box that we drew for the unwrapper and this is how the unwrapper works. So if we just turn on the basic shape level and just check that box there you'll see how the part looks. Now we have quite an interesting shape there, we seem to have lost that box and that's because the decorative shapes level is currently adding on top of the basic shape level. What we need to do is we need to set the combine mode of this level to merge. So let's just right click, go to the combine mode, set that to merge. You'll see now it's blending in and we're back to the original square shape that we drew originally. So now we're going to look at adding on the octagonal shape to this bulbous region here. So let's just turn the wrap view off. So go to the Toolpath, toolpath drawing, wrapping off. I'm going to go into the 2D view and then we'll just use this option here to zoom to fit. Go into the layer manager, I'm just going to switch off the components layer and then we're just going to make the unwrapped vectors layer the active layer. And we'll just click into the uh, white space here. So let's go into the drawing tab. I'm going to look at drawing that octagonal shape in order for us to unwrap and create the new cross section. So here we're going to go over to the draw polygon tool. So we're creating an octagonal shape so that has eight sides, center point, x0, y0, the radius. Now, I'm not actually sure here. I know the distance across the flats to the lowest and the highest point um, because we measured those profiles earlier. So we'll just go with one here and press create and we'll close that down. We'll take that, I'm going to press F9 to put that into the centre of my job. Remember, anything that we're going to unwrap must be in the centre there. And so for the large octagon, which was at this point here, uh, we measured the height of 3.5. So we're going to look at resizing this polygon to a width and height of 3.5. So with that selected, let's go over to set selected object size and we'll link XY and we're going to make that 3.5 and we'll go ahead and apply that. Then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to right click and I'm going to copy this and then we're going to look at changing the height of this octagon to the height of the area that we measured to the lowest point of our octagonal point there, which was 1.5. So here we're just going to change the value to 1.5, press apply there, and then we could close out of that form, in which case we could just simply right click and then paste in the original. And so these shapes are equivalent to the diameter for this point here, and then for the small one for this point here. And so now we're going to look at unwrapping both of these vectors and we can only do this one at a time. So we'll look at unwrapping the first, the, the smallest one first. So with that selected, let's go over to the gadgets, wrapping, vector and wrapper. Okay, so you can see it's created that there for us. And then we'll just go ahead and select the outer one, go to the gadgets, wrapping, vector and wrapper you'll see it's created this cross section for us here. 
So here we're going to take that one, shift and select this one and with those both selected we're going to press 9 on the keyboard to rotate them both uh, in 45 degree increments and then we'll just take those and we'll just position them and move them down to the bottom over here. So let's just select both of these vectors and we'll look at deleting them. Go to the layers and we're just going to look at deleting the unwrapped vectors layer that it created here. So just right click there, I'm just going to delete that. I'm going to delete the data also, so we'll just go ahead and press OK. So now we're going to look at creating the rails for the octagonal bulbous shape that we're going to create in this area here. We're actually going to use two sets of rails to create this shape successfully and you'll see why shortly. So the first set of rails we're going to create are going to be the actual width of our part. So we're going to go over into our layer manager. I'm just going to make the rails layer the active layer as we're about to create our rails. And then we're going to go into the polyline. I'm just going to wake this point up here on the left hand side and follow along the vertical until it meets that horizontal line where I can click to create my first start point. Then we're just going to zoom in over this area here. So we want to pick up this point uh, on the right hand side of our octagonal shape. And we're just going to follow that line across until it meets the horizontal line at the bottom of our workspace. And I could just click to accept that and we'll use this space bar just to come out there and we'll just zoom out and we're just going to follow the left side of that newly created rail I'm just going to follow along the vertical to keep that in line until we meet the top we can see there that it's met the top there so I can just click to create our first point and I could come along the right hand side until we meet the right hand side of our vector that we've got. We can just follow along the vertical and then we could just simply click that in place and then we could just space to exit out there. So we've got our two horizontal rails that represent the width of our part there and now we're going to go and create uh, the vertical rails. So we're going to snap to the end point here. So I'm just going to click and just snap to the top point there by just clicking use the space bar to accept that and again we're going to go to the bottom here so you'll notice that I am going in the same direction for each of the rails just to ensure that the both rails are going in the same direction and then we'll just snap to the top there click that in place and then I can right click to come out of the polyline tool now there is one more vector that we need to create the swept shape and that's something that we're going to extract from our original profile. So it's this area here and we're going to use this to give us the depth for our octagon. Now because we're going to use this area for our depth, we don't actually need the vertical edges on our two new cross sections that we created using the vector and wrapper. So you could just look at taking those legs off. So to do that we're just going to select one of those vectors, press N on the keyboard to go into node edit mode. I'm just going to right click and delete the span or I could press D on the keyboard. So I'm just going to click there to delete it and then hover over this span, use the shortcut D to delete that go into this one and we'll say D to delete and then again over to the left hand side D to delete that and we'll just right click just to come out of that selection and then right click again just to come out of node edit mode. So now I need to create a copy of our original profile vector that we've got here. So I'm just going to take that and holding down control I'm just going to move that up to the top there and try and keep that in line vertically and this is the only area that I need this bulbous shape here so let's go into node edit mode by pressing N on the keyboard I'm just going to right click on this node here I'm going to use this option to cut the vector come over to the right hand side here right click cut that vector there and then I could just simply using the delete key on my keyboard delete this side and then I'm going to come over and go back into the normal selection mode 
Now the reason why I've kept this vector here is because I need to create legs for this cross section just to give us the full shape from the centre of our spindle. And so what I need to do is look at creating a leg that's going to go from this point here to the length of the actual centre of the spindle there. So I'm just going to keep this here temporarily while I go ahead and go into the polyline tool. I'm just going to zoom in there. I'm going to snap to this point here and then snap over to this point here just to wake that up so I can follow that along. So I've got the exact uh, height of the leg there where the centre of our spindle is going to be. And then I could just simply use the a space bar just to add that in and then come over here and then I could just simply come down wake this point up to create the leg on the right hand side and there we have snapped in place and I can just click that in and then I can right click out and I can just take this vector here you can just delete that you can see that I'm currently on the rails layer so I'm just going to take that's why these are blue so we're just going to take all of these vectors here I'm going to look at joining them so I'll go over to the join option it's going to say that when we join them we're going to have one open vector at this tolerance once we've joined them and we can close that down you can see it because we've joined them it's joined them back to the original vectors layer and that's why that vector is now all black so let's just use this option here to zoom to fit. So what we did there was take a copy of this bulging shape, moved it up to the top where we added in the vertical lines to give the shape the correct height from the centre of the spindle. And then these vectors that we have here are just going to give us the octagonal shape with the lower shape at each end of the Bolden shape and then the higher shape is going to be at the highest point. And so that's why we did the measurements earlier to get the right curvature for when these vectors are unwrapped. Now the last thing I need to do is to create some extra geometry to enable us to accurately position where this larger octagonal cross section is going to go when we come to apply the two rail sweep. So to do that let's just go into the polyline tool and I'm just going to snap to the highest point of that bulging shape. So you can see my cursor has changed. It's allowed me to snap to that point. So I'm just going to click and then come down. I'm just going to snap to the highest point on the original profile there. Click that and then we'll just right click to come out there. So now if we select the rail here and if we just go into node edit mode, what I can do is position the midpoint so that it's at the intersection of where the highest point is for the actual profile. So I'm just going to take that and I'm just going to come over and just snap that in position like so. Do the same for the bottom, so I'm just going to select this drive rail. I'm just going to take that midpoint there, come over and snap to the intersection there and just click that in place. I can just right click to come out, right click again to come out in node edit mode. I'm just going to take that vector there and we're going to delete it as we no longer need that anymore. So now with our drive rails we can see we have our highest point so I'm easily able to snap my cross section to the highest point of those two rails. So now we're ready to actually create the swept shapes for the bulging octagonal area that's going to go in this position here. So the first thing that we need to do is just go to our layer manager. I'm going to switch on the components layer, make that the active layer so that our grayscales will be added to this layer so that they don't obscure any of the vector layers that we've got below it. And then we're just going to click into the white space here. Let's go ahead and tile our windows. So you can see the part that we currently have. If we go into the modeling tab, I'm just going to switch off the basic shape for the time being. Make sure the decorative shapes level is the active level so that the new octagonal shapes that we make here will be added into this level. So we're going to start by placing in the 
octagonal cross sections. So to help me, I think I should just maximize the 2D view. Click in the 2D view and just press F to fit that to screen. Then we could go over to the two rail sweep tool. So we're going to select our rail. So we'll select the top one, shift and select the second. And so with those selected, we're going to use this option here to use selection. And you can see they have now transformed into drive rails. So now we need to position our cross sections. Remember we spoke about the smaller cross section being on the left and the right hand side. So we're just going to take that and we're just going to click that in place. And that's applied that from the start point all the way through to the end point over here. Now we need to apply a second cross section, which is the larger of the two octagonal shapes, where it's going to go into the highest point at the peak of the bulging shape. So we're going to take that cross section and I'm just going to come over to my rail and you'll see there my cursor is telling me that we are snapping to a node here and I know that that node is that node that represents the highest point of the bulging shape so let's just find that again so there it is I'm just going to click that in place so we've got the smaller cross section the larger cross section going back into the smaller cross section let's give that a name we're going to call this one octagonal shape and then we could go ahead press apply and then if we just tile our windows we can take a look at the part that we've got in the 3D view and so you can see here we do have a very shallow shape now we'll see what this will look like when we add in the bulging shape to give us the Z dimension so let's just maximize the 2D view and we'll just press F to fit that to screen. I'm going to use this option here to start a new component. So this time we're going to select this rail here, shift and select this rail here. I'm going to use the option here to use selection and to apply that cross section. Give that a name, we'll just call this one bulging shape. And then we'll go ahead and press apply. Again, let's just tile the windows to take a look at that part. We'll just close out of the two rail sweep form. And so we can see the shape generated in the three axis environment, where the two profiles are just adding on top of each other. So if we just uncheck that, so you can see the bulging shape there. And all we've done is just added the octagonal cross sections on top there. So let's have a look at this in the wrapped view. So we'll just maximize the 3D view, go to toolpaths, toolpath drawing, wrap the Y values. And so we can see that octagonal shape following the actual bold shape that we created. So now I want to merge this shape with the original shape. So let's just switch on the basic shape level. Okay, so we can see how all of the components combined look in the rotary view. Now as long as the shape that we've created here is larger than the original shape we had then it will just overlap it and we don't need to worry about what's underneath. Now if the original shape was sticking through here then what we'd have to do is just go back to the main profile and then just look at deleting that section out and then replace it with the section uh, that we've got here, this bold shape. So now that we're ready, we can go ahead and recalculate the toolpaths based on the new shapes that we've created. And so to do that, we need to go back into the standard view. So let's go to toolpaths, toolpath drawing, and we'll just switch the wrapping off. Go ahead and tile our windows, and we'll just switch over to the toolpaths tab. Now because we've not created the new components outside of the existing vector boundaries that we specified when creating the original toolpaths, we should just be able to recalculate the toolpaths without editing them. So to do that we simply come over to recalculate all the toolpaths and that will create the 3D roughing based on what the software can now see with the new shapes. The pockets will be exactly the same as before and the 3D finishing again will be calculated based on what it can see here. 
So all the toolpaths were successfully recalculated, so we'll OK that. We'll just go ahead and maximise the 3D view, and we could come over to the preview toolpaths, where we could just go ahead and preview all of those toolpaths. You can see it's cut in the roughing toolpath there, and then it's going to go and create the pockets for us, and then it's going to move on and create that finish with the new shapes that we've got in there. So let's have a look at our toolpath preview in the wrapped view. So we'll go to toolpaths, toolpath drawing, wrap the Y values, and we can see how our part is going to look. So what we see here is a very good representation of what we would expect to see on our machine if we were to save these toolpaths out. So once you're happy with the wrapped preview, then what you could do is come out here and then go ahead and save out those toolpaths to the appropriate post processor and then run them on your CNC. Okay, I'm not going to do that in this case, but we've gone through uh, all of the information about post processors with Rotary. So let's just go ahead and close that down. So at this point it would be a good idea to save the file. Go to File, Save As, and in the Project folder, I'm going to call this one Rotary Machining 3D Toolpaths. Press Save and you can access that from the Project folder. And so that concludes this tutorial on creating a 3D part for Rotary Machining. There are other tutorials available that cover 2D and 2.5D rotary machining and how to import and unwrap a 3D model for rotary machining. And you can find these videos in the related videos section for this tutorial on the tutorial browser.